Good evening, everybody, and welcome to EPIC. My name is Jackie Lynham, and I work in Dublin City Libraries, and I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of Dublin City Libraries and Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. Um, this is part of our One Dublin, One Book initiative, which some of you might not be familiar with. Um, the idea behind it is to encourage as many people as possible to read a book connected with Dublin over the month of April, and this year's chosen book is Nora, a love story of Nora Barnacle and James Joyce by Nuala O'Connor, and Nuala is here this evening, and she will be in conversation with Nathan Mannion, um, who is head of exhibitions and programmes here at EPIC. So I want to say a big thank you to Nathan and to Dara Doyle for their help and enthusiasm um, in putting together tonight's programme. When we got, uh, when we were coming up with some ideas a couple of months ago, Nuala thought it would be a great fit. Um, to partner with EPIC, and it really is because this is the Irish Emigration Museum and James Joyce and, and Nora Barnagal, of course, left Ireland in their early 20s and didn't return. So I hope that you get a chance at some stage to check out EPIC, and I hope you get a chance to check out One Dublin, One Book as well. We have lots more events happening over the month, and you can borrow a copy in your local library, or you can buy in your local bookshop, and they're actually on sale here in the uh, EPIC uh, shop as well. So I'm going to hand you over now to Nuala and to Nathan, and I hope you enjoy this evening's event. Thank you, Jackie, and welcome everyone on behalf of EPIC. Um, thanks for joining us here in person, and for those of you joining us online, you're all very welcome. Before we begin, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction to the role of letter writing for migrants and emigrants from Ireland over the last couple of hundred years, and then we'll move over and start to talk specifically about Joyce and Snorris letters with Nuala. So the private writings of those who came before us have long held the interest of historians and scholars alike. They provide insights into the personal beliefs and inner lives of the writers and allow us to engross ourselves in the intimate details that they share. Many 19th and 20th century emigrant letters, particularly those sent from Irish emigrants living in North America, were known for their distinctive idioms and rhetoric. Within many museums of migration, like here at EPIC, um, and scholarly publications, the letters have often been left to speak for themselves, often offering similarly direct access to personal experience as described for an intimate circle. But should they be? Making sense of emigrant correspondence is a daunting undertaking, and context often proves crucial. Emigrants use, and continue to use, words to maintain emotional, social, and economic ties in defiance of physical separation, something we've all grown more familiar with over the last couple of years. Letters were used to influence decisions at home, to tease out family connections and enterprises, and above all, often, to regulate future immigration. However, many of the surviving letters we most often come across are of a semi-public nature, so even when the soul of the author is bared, it was done self-consciously before a mixed audience. The vividly detailed series of letters exchanged between Joyce and Barnacle, an Irish emigrant couple often separated for long periods of time, are far more intimate and convey the sense of longing and urgency experienced by many others who find themselves in long distance relationships. And tonight, we'll explore Nora's story and the important role emigrant letters play in shaping our understanding of our predecessors. So to begin, Nuala, thanks for joining us. I'd like to ask, what first inspired you to write about Barnacle? So I suppose like all novels that I undertake, they come on a sort of a, a grouping of things will happen that makes me want to launch forward and devote a couple of years of my life to a project. So I was aware of Nora already when I moved to Galway 25 years ago as the sort of earthy maverick who had run away unmarried with Joyce to Europe. And I used to go to the annual Bloomsday celebration at Nora Barnacle's mother's house, which is now the Nora Barnacle Museum, a tiny little two-room house in Bowling Green in Galway. Um, and I had seen Pat Murphy's film, mm. and I had read Brenda mm. Maddox's biography of Nora. So I was very aware of her. She was there in the background as a wonderful Galway woman. Um, I had adopted a cat and called her Nora Barnacle. Um, <laughs> I was studying Italian by night in NUI Galway, mm. and one of my essays was to write about Joyce's friendship in Trieste with Italo Svevo, the Italian writer. And all the time I was doing the research for that, I was sort of looking past Joyce and thinking about Nora and wondering to myself, how does she feel about her life with Joyce? Mm. What's it m like for someone who is an ordinary, essentially uneducated, that is, educated to the age of 12, mm. literate woman, 
um, who's not interested in literature, how does her life pan out with a uh, modernist genius, you know? Mm -hmm. So this thought process was happening and I decided I'd write a short story, which is what I did. The story starts on the 16th of June, 1904, which was the first day they walked out together down to Ring's End and had an intimate moment. Um, and the story ended actually on October the 8th, 1904, when they ran away together to Europe. They, when I finished the story, and it did well, it was published and granted, won a prize, I, I found my commune with Nora was not over. I wanted to stay with her. I wanted, I, I have an attraction to mavericks anyway, especially maverick women. I'd already written a book about Emily Dickinson, the American poet. I'd written a book about Belle Bilton, who was an English music hall dancer who married into the Irish aristocracy. So I was already fascinated by women who had gone against the grain. Mm. I was interested in them. So Nora sort of presented herself to me as the perfect person to <laughs> deal with next. And as a dub living in Galway, I felt I had a good, um, I had a good inroad in a sense in that I had understanding of both Joyce and Dublin and then also a little of Galway. I don't think I'll ever fully understand Galway, despite my quarter of a century living there. But um, I felt like I was in a good position to write about them. Brilliant, great. Um, and I suppose, focusing in on their letters, the first letter Joyce sends to Barnacle is during a return visit to Ireland um, in 1909, while Nora remained in Trieste. Separation, longing and loneliness are all experiences intimately familiar to migrants worldwide, still so today. And in your fictional response, you make a point of reminding Joyce of their shared bed in Trieste. From your research, how do you feel Barnacle and Joyce managed during their time apart? Well, he managed very badly. <laughs> he was very um, dependent on Nora. They had a very close and loving relationship in which she did all of the um, <laughs> bolstering and being a rock. And as a naturally cheerful, charismatic, earthy woman, she was able for this tender, nervy, sensitive man mm who also was a fantastic writer. So she was able to bolster him up. So the 1909 letters are one thing, but they did actually correspond before that. These were the days before technology, etc., mm -hmm. and the postal service was marvelous in Ireland. And so they did actually write to each other a lot before they left. But I'd like to read you Joyce's very first letter sure. that he wrote to Nora, mm -hmm. and it was the 15th of June, so the day before what is now immortalized as Bloomsday. Um, so they had met each other on the 10th of June on Nassau Street. He had approached her, this wonderful looking, earthy, gorgeous, auburn haired lady, and um, asked would she like to walk out with him, and they made a date for the 14th of June, and Nora didn't show up. She was working in Finn's hotel, and chances are she was busy that night, or the hotel was busy. So the next day she receives a letter from James A. Joyce, as he signed it, on the 15th of June, 1904, and he said, he was writing from Shelburne Road, I may be blind, I looked for a long time at a head of reddish brown hair and decided it was not yours. I went home quite dejected. I would like to make an appointment, but it might not suit you. I hope you'll be kind enough to make one with me, if you have not forgotten me, exclamation <laughs> mark. And that's the entirety of the letter. So it's, it's pure Joyce. He's kind of given out to her while also being quite sensitive and also being hopeful of a meeting. Both Joyce and Nora were confident people. Mm. You couldn't take that from them at all. He may have been nervy and sensitive, but he had a confidence about who he was, his vision for his life mm. and his writing, which is, again, a lovely way to go through life to be confident. But he found other people mm. tricky. But he knew a good thing when he saw it, and Nora yeah. Barnacle was a good thing, clearly. <laughs> and uh, they were pretty much inseparable after that, and when they were separated, they wrote letters. Yeah, and I think that's a lovely segue into my next question, which is how important do you think that correspondence was to their relationship? I think it was crucial because, as I said, he did not do well without her by his side. Mm. So in 1909, he's in Dublin. He has come here to set up the Volta Cinema on Mary Street. There is no cinema, public cinema, in Ireland, and Joyce is the man to set it up. So with backers from Trieste, where they're living, he comes to them to set it up. But of course it means being separated mm -hmm. from Nora uh, and the children. They have their two children at this point, Giorgio and Lucia. So he comes here and he hears a rumor that Nora has actually been with one of his friends right around the time that they had been together. Mm -hmm. And he is 
heartbroken, angry, and he works himself into such a state that he, first of all, he believes what he's heard, mm. but also into such a state that he's a nervous wreck and starts to write her accusatory letters back to her in Trieste um, about this alleged incident. So I thought I might read just my, uh, an extract from the chapter in the book that deals with that, just to give you a flavor of what was going on. Um, all of the letters from Joyce that I have used in the book, I have rewrote. And the reason I did that was, and I closely mimicked his uh, message and sentiment and words sometimes. I did it because of copyright reasons. The Joyce estate was notoriously litigious, as you probably know. And Stephen Joyce was still alive when I was writing this book, and I was in terror of him. And so I rewrote the letters. Uh, Stephen died in January. Uh, 2020, the book came out in January 21, but um, yeah, so that's why I did that, and then I had to make up Nora's letters, obviously, because, well, certainly the erotic ones are not extant. So I'll just read a little bit of this. Um, I did have a bookmark in it, and I managed to take it out, but I'll find it very quickly, because I know the date. So he's over here, she's back there, minding the children. His brother Stanny is living with them in Trieste as well. So Stanny features in this um, chapter two. Oh my goodness me. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to find it. Okay, here we go. A letter comes from Jim and it's the worst thing I've ever read. And I'm split open with sadness and confusion and I'm ripping with anger besides. How he denounces and mistrusts me. He says he won't go to Galway to see my people as we had planned, nor will he go to Monsell's, the publisher, to see about his book. I know I had a small, indiscreet moment with Stanny, but that's as nothing to compared to what Jim accuses me of. He writes these blame-filled words to me and how they sting, for they are all lies. I have heard it from your lover's lips, he writes. I cannot even write my sorrow, my degradation. I sit here and cry, wrung out. The vision of you with your mouth on his, your body laid before him, dances before me. Pity me, Nora, I am suffering mightily. My faith in you is smashed to smithereens. I will cry, I know it, for days. I cannot call you my love or my goosine or any other affectionate name because like everyone else, you have betrayed me. You. You, who were my only faithful one. Is this the end, Nora? This, I ask you, is Giorgio mine. We lay together on October the 11th for the first time, in Zurich, and yet he came on July 27th. That, by my sums, is nine months and 16 days. You bled little onto the sheep, Nora, I recall, where you fucked by another before me. He accuses me of having trysts with that Egypt, Vincent Cosgrave, a man I would not touch with a barge pole, let alone a yardstick. And yet, here I sit, charged with all sorts of indecency by the one person who knows and loves me best, accused of duping him as to Georgie. I can't stand it. I crumple up Jim's horrid letter, toss it into my trunk, and resolve not to write to him at all. For why should I reply to such vile things? I will send only silence across the waves to Dublin. It's all Jim deserves. So that's a little extract from that uh, chapter. Thanks. And I think that's it's a wonderful insight into, into your, your writing process, which is something I'd like to talk a little bit more about, mm. because obviously Nora's replies don't, don't still exist today. Um, how did you put yourself into the mind of Nora, and what was the process you used to draft those fictional responses to Joyce's letters? So the story from there about Cosgrave goes on, and mm -hmm. Jim is reassured by his friend, Byrne, that this indeed did not happen, and Cosgrave is only trying to annoy you, and uh, he writes, Stanny too writes to Jim to say, don't believe it, she would never have done that to you, and uh, Byrne says the same, you know, don't, they're, they're only trying to sort of annoy you and irritate you and mm -hmm. make you feel bad because you've made a success of your life uh, for the last mm -hmm. five years and being away. And the writing, you know, he was having things published. So um, 
the <laughs> correspondence grows warmer then. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. He writes to her to say, oh, now you tell me it's not true. So he's, he's managing to forgive her and accuse her at the same time in the next few letters yes. that go back and forth. Um, and we don't have Nora's replies, and God knows they were probably destroyed, but also they may yet turn up in some trunk or valise mm. or attic in Trieste or Paris or somewhere. Yeah. It would be wonderful if they did, but her side is missing. So for every letter we have of Joyce's, I had to write a reply. And so I used his as a call and response mm -hmm. guide. And um, eventually he says to her in these 1909 letters, there's a type of letter you might write to me that, um, you know, I think... I'd like to read, mm. do you know what I mean? Hint, hint. And she knows exactly what he means. He, she, he wants something stimulating yes. to keep them, um, what would you say, sensually charged while they're apart. <laughs> so Nora knows exactly what he means, writes a letter that's a little bit explicit mm -hmm. and sends it off and he's absolutely delighted. So then this begins this torrent of what we now call politely the erotic letters and not so politely the filthy letters um, and you can read these online and they are extraordinary in their frankness their sexual explicitness the uh, insight into Joyce's tastes and titillations as regards um, his love for <laughs> the coprophilic as it's politely called um, and they're astonishing but they also um, are very poetic mm. They're very loving. He sees nobility in Nora and dignity, and he tells her about that, and he lays himself before her, I'm terrible. He still also manages to be slightly mean-spirited in the letters at times, um, demanding and, you know, when I come home, don't talk about money, don't have ashes in your hair, you know, mm -hmm. wear such a such a thing, you know, he wanted her to wear black underwear, mm -hmm. you know, don't have garlic and onions in the house, be nice to me, you know, very sort of uh, controlling kind of letters. But um, the letters are both surprising and beautiful. They're, they're sort of poetic, you know, you are my rain-drenched flower of the mountain, and in the next sentence, it's, he's telling her what he wants to do to her in bed, you know. So, yeah, they're, they're well worth a read. Obviously, we should know nothing about these letters. They are the private sharings between two lovers, but... When you're writing a novel like this mm. and those letters are in the public domain, it's very difficult to ignore them. Yeah, well, I mean, that leads very well into my next question, which is to start with, um, Stephen Joyce famously destroyed correspondence between his aunt Lucia and Samuel Beckett, mm -hmm. saying that I didn't want to have greedy little eyes and greedy little fingers going over them. And I know that Joyce's letters have been, made, have been a great benefit to you while writing Nora, as you've just said, um, but do you feel they should have been made public? And if so, do you feel it's merely a matter of waiting for Joyce and Barnacle to pass out of living memory? Or what other factors would you consider relevant in making a judgment call on the matter? Yeah, well, I mean, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. when they are there, and you're, you, you have to sort of use them in a sense. Mm -hmm. But for Stephen, mm -hmm. this is his beloved Nano and Nana. You know, who wants to see their grandparent, their grandfather refer to their granny as darling brown arsed? That board, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's 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 stuff your relatives shouldn't know, and certainly the general public mm. shouldn't know. So my sympathy and empathy was always with Stephen. Mm. Um, I know he was unusually difficult when it came to the estate. In uh, he reacted to things, and you know, but I could sort of see where he was coming from too. He was being extremely protective. He may have gone about it in not very helpful ways mm. at times, but um, yeah, I, the public domain thing is difficult, isn't it? It's 75 years after mm -hmm. death, but yeah, we're still, there's still a lot of Joyce and Barnacle relatives about the place. How do they feel about it? Are they embarrassed about it? You know, Anne Enright spoke about shame being uh, the national <laughs> topic of Irish literature, and there must be a certain amount of shame I certainly, I think Nora would have mm. been shamed by this. You know, at one stage, Joyce asked her to defecate in front mm. of him, and she couldn't look at him for the shame afterwards. Um, and so, you know, we know that she had shame. And mm. I was thinking about Joyce the other day and wondering about the notion of shame with him. And I came up with um, 
yes, he's a modernist writer who writes very mm. frank and open things, but he was very sort of um, middle class <coughs> also in his outlook, and he may have shunned religion, but he still respected religion in a lot of ways. But I did come to the conclusion in my little thought process, I was just lying in bed thinking because I couldn't sleep, and I was thinking, yeah, Joyce certainly did have elements of shame the way any Irish Catholic probably does. Mm. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to throw off. Um, so I feel that Nora's shame and perhaps Joyce's about these letters would have been very real. And I, I, I really felt it for Stephen. Mm. who was you know Because one of the letters came up at Sotheby's, I think in 2004, and he tried to block it being sold, and it was sold. And then, of course, it ends up in the public domain in some way. And he, you know again, he said, at the time, he said, I'm, I'm glad I don't have children. Imagine, mm -hmm. imagine them seeing their whole family's private life laid out like this. And my heart kind of shriveled for him, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, it's a difficult one. It's tricky. And I know that it's something you have to deal with here in the museum about who owns what and who should see what and how things get displayed, etc. It's a tricky one. I don't know. I just felt I couldn't ignore them. They were there and they're famous. And, you know, they, did, they do add a layer of, because, when you're writing biographical fiction, you're essentially embodying and empathizing people. <laughs> you get to show the inner life and the private life in a way that biography probably doesn't, mm -hmm. unless there's material extant. And so writing someone's sex life is an act of the imagination. But Joyce contributed to my doing of that by writing the letters. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very valid point as well, because I think even Joyce himself said, while whenever he was in public, if someone made a lewd joke, he made a point of not reacting to it. And yet, you know, when you have his own intimate correspondence from the erotic letters, obviously that wasn't always the case. Yeah. Um, so how would he have thought of the being made public? I'm sure it would have been hugely embarrassing for him had he been alive and they would have been made. That's what I kind of mean the about realm. them. They're, they're, they were kind of square, like mm. especially by the, even though they lived this, what looks like a very maverick, exotic life, by the time they got to Paris and they were in their 40s, they were kind of settled yeah. and they were slightly appalled at Lucia and Giorgio's antics with the lost generation mm. type people, the running around, you know, drinking their heads off, talking very freely and openly about their bodies, in fact, showing their bodies yeah. and stuff. So, you know, I don't know if square, square is probably the really the wrong word, but maybe a bit prim. They were slightly prim by the time of the Paris years. They were in their 40s. They were entitled to be. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they were, that was certainly the case in that. The, yeah. You know, keeping up appearances was, was quite important to... Yeah, but like, aren't we all yeah. like that? We're all sort of a bit fake in public and we're our own way in private, including in correspondence where we get to be ourselves, particularly mm. people we know intimately, whether they're partners or... Like, I write differently to my sisters than I write, say, to my mother. You know, I tell my sisters more and yeah. I use a sort of a jokey, slangy language with my sisters where I'm more formal with my aunt or my mother, mm. you know, so... Yeah, we all kind of wear different faces to different exactly, audiences. Yeah. And they were no different than we are today. I think yeah, it's, it's remembering like... Remembering that human connection. Is it's kind of performative, isn't it? Mm. Writing a letter, you know, in a way. I certainly... I was a kid who kept a diary. I was a kid who wrote letters. And I went to live abroad a few times. I went to live in Switzerland. I went to live in Germany, Scotland at various times. And, you know, even when I moved to Galway, sometimes the letters crop up at home. Someone will say, oh, I found a stash of letters from you and give them to me. And I read them and they are like performances. I'm trying to make my sisters laugh. I know, and I think it's it, what, I, what I mentioned earlier as well. Part of it is trying to maintain those emotional connections across, you know, a vast separation, whether it's physical or, you know, they might not even geographically be that far away, but if they aren't someone that you see regularly or aren't a core part of your life in the way that they might have been before. And you're very reluctant to see that pass and so letter writing or today texts or emails or whatever it might be kind of takes the place of that. And those connections are still really important. Um, and it kind of, I suppose it delays the decay over time that you often see from some of the migrant letters that we would have in the museum as well. Often they're quite formulaic, you know, they're written for a specific purpose. They could be remittances, so people are sending money home and they're very keen. They know that they aren't, you know, intimate erotic letters like, like that we had, we're discussing here but they'll be read by maybe the core family, even the neighbours. Often literacy was a challenge as well, so when responses were drafted, you would have a local doctor, or priest or teacher who would write it on behalf of the parents in most cases. So you already knew there would be a small group of people who would be reading word by word. So 
kind of formulaic responses started to come and everything was painted in quite rosy pictures. You'd find, oh, I'm doing really well here, I've got a great job. Um, and when you see gaps in correspondence, it was generally because people were reluctant to write negativity. They mightn't have enough money to send back, you know, a check to the family yeah. um, to keep them going. And rather than say, oh, you know, things are tight at the moment, they just didn't respond. And then they'd come back, it could be weeks or months later, saying, oh, it's just been very busy, very hectic. And then when things are better. So you find that there's a drift over time between yeah. how people connect. It's kind of sad. But I, there also is the thing whereby children who were literate writing mm. home, they would have learned how to write a letter in school, so yeah. they would be using formulaic mm -hmm. phrases. But I came across, when I was researching an article to write about emigrant letters, I came across some wonderful extracts from Irish emigrant letters. Mm -hmm. And this woman is certainly very um, upfront in how she's feeling. And this is the terrible thing about the time lag between mm. letters. And her name was Cathy, and she wrote, I'm heartsick, fretting to think it's now going and gone into the third month since you wrote me. I feel as if I'm dead. This is a world of troubles. So she'd emigrated to America and she was so homesick. She felt mm -hmm. like she was dead and it just broke my heart. Um, and then other, there's another great quote from, these, from one of those emigrant letters and it was, uh, many times I dream I'm with you, but I find my great mistake when I awake from my sleep. Isn't that so heartbreaking? Mm. Um, so women were always great language mm. innovators and adopters of new ways of speaking, but they also, when you study emigrant letters in any small way, that women write in, in a more chatty, mm -hmm. conversational style. And when you read Nora Barnacle's letters, the ones that we have to her mother and to various people, there's the run-on sentences that we think Joyce later co-opted as Molly Bloom's soliloquy. So there's no punctuation. <laughs> She's just, you know, and the news hops, and this is like Molly's mind. It hops from thing mm. to thing. So, you know, Jim is very bad with the eyes. Um, I heard my mother is sick with the lumbago, or whatever it is, mm. and the whole thing. And then Lucia is doing very well at the dancing, and the sentences just go on and on and on and on down the page. So they're kind of... The purpose of the letter is news chat and bringing you up to date on what's going on. And they're generally not, you know, philosophical. No. <laughs> but yeah. then you read Joyce's letters and they're a different kettle of fish altogether, you know, so. And in part of that, I suppose, it's just the audience they're intended for as well. Like you mentioned, how you would write differently to your, your aunt versus your sister. Yeah. The content of the letters obviously shifts as well in line with the audience that they're intended for. And actually, that's a good lead into my next question, which was that Nora often wrote mock letters to her mother, mainly as a, mean, as a means of reprimanding Joyce uh, for what she considered as failings. But though in reality, she actually rarely corresponded with her mother. Um, do you think she ever regretted that distance from Anne? Annie? Yeah, so Nora was raised by her grandmother, very near to where her mother and siblings were. But she was raised because you know, it was normal for families to foster mm -hmm. out children. Mrs. Barnacle was busy with three smallies when she sent Nora to live with Granny Healy, mm -hmm. her own mother. So Nora was essentially raised as a, an only child mm -hmm. with Granny and with Uncle Tommy in the house. So she had a different life to her mm -hmm. siblings who all grew up together. Um, so she was a little bit different always, maybe sidelined is not the word, but she was separate from, yeah. apart from. Um, so she didn't have an enormous closeness mm -hmm. with Annie Healy. And when she ran away, because Uncle Tommy beat her for going out with a Protestant mm -hmm. boy. She didn't tell them. It wasn't until she was par in Paris she sent a postcard to say, gone away, yeah. you know, to Europe or whatever. And then for years she did not correspond with her mother. And it was kind of a cruel silence, really, because Annie must have been dying to know what was mm. going on with her daughter. And in fact, two of Nora's other siblings who went away didn't correspond with their mother either. Now, you can look at that and draw conclusions. Maybe they weren't a family who liked writing. Mm. Maybe there was some issue with the mother whereby the children didn't feel like writing to her. Maybe they just hated, you know, hated their emigration and didn't want to write back. Mm. But eventually Nora, well, Nora used to write these letters and say, I'm going to get the children baptized and this man can't support us and all of this sort of stuff. And there were threats to Jim because she yes. knew the power of words. And she would write the letters and sort of dictate them out loud to herself. Dear Mammy, I'm coming home to Ireland with my children. And then she'd put them in an envelope, put the uh, address on them, no stamp, and sit them there beside the ashtray so he'd see them. And they were just little threats. They were a little power move. 
you know, you get into line, stop drinking, bring home money to us that's worth something so that I can feed our children and I won't have to send these letters. But eventually she did write to her mother more warmly and they began mm. to correspond and their relationship grew warmer. And then when Jim was in Ireland in 1909, he did go and see um, Mrs. Barnacle and she sang the Lass of Ockham to him, sitting at her kitchen table in Bowling Green, a beautiful scene. And he wrote back to Nora in Trieste, your mother sang your song and you know, I can see she's, I can see you're her daughter. He found similarities. Mm. And he had a good relationship with Annie and with Nora's uncle Michael, who helped them financially when they were really on the uppers in Switzerland the first time. Mm. So these warm relationships, obviously Joyce only came back twice to Ireland. Um, these warm relationships happened across correspondence. He had a great correspondence with Michael Healy as well. Uh, and it was Michael who encouraged him to send a copy of manuscript copy of Poems Penny Each to NUI Galway, mm -hmm. which he did, illustrated by Lucia. Something the library is very proud of. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yes, letter writing was an important thing then. And I have to say I am a postcard sender. I'm not so much a letter sender anymore because, I don't know, I've grown lazy. Find the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's pure laziness. And sometimes I'll type a letter if it's for several friends and then adjust it accordingly. Mm. <laughs> I suppose there's something we're I shouldn't be wrong. releasing my secrets. <laughs> well, too late now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably something we're all guilty of as well. Like people talk about the decline of letter writing as, as we start to move more and more online. We start to engage in different ways. And yeah. That's led to a change with communications. Um, and you've written, it, you've written about yourself when you've said that the internet now has us wedded to the written word in novel ways. Uh, how do you think Joyce and Barnacle, if they were alive today, might have adopted to this revolution in human communication? I'm sure it's innovative, so Joyce would have loved it. Mm. Um, Nora, for all her uh, <laughs> modernist doings along with your man, because she had no choice, basically, she was his, his rock and his muse, and she went with him wherever he went. They moved so much. Um, but like most people, she just wanted to settle down and have a sort mm -hmm. of a quiet and normal home life. And to, she wanted possessions, she wanted furniture. She may not have been as quick to adapt um, to things like the technological stuff, though I'm sure Joyce would have loved them. I mean, he sort of anticipated so much with his wonderful writing, mm -hmm. you know. And I was listening to um, Doreena Gallagher last night reciting from Finnegan's Wake at our event in Rathmines. Mm -hmm. and just to listen to the music of the poetry, of the prose, like, it's just incredible to think how many writers now write like that, and he did it way back then, and it's just such a beautiful thing. Um, what he gave us is so beautiful. I have to say, by researching this novel and then writing it, and then in a sense researching again so that I could talk about it, because you start to forget what you've made up and what's real. I. Um, I have much more love and empathy for both of them than I had even when I started. And I started mm. this project with such excitement in my heart. And I, my husband works from home as well. And, and we both have always worked at home for years and years and years. And we meet at 10 in the morning for a cup of tea. And I'd come racing down the stairs full of news about what mm. I had just researched and what I was going to put into the novel. And I love when a novel takes me like that, mm. that I'm sort of living it body and soul and loving it. It was an absolute joy to write, a joy to research. It's a joy to talk about. Though I find I talk a lot more about them as opposed to the book. And I sometimes forget what's in the book. And so when I'm picking scenes to read, it's like it's almost news to me, you know. Because it's a long process publishing a book. It came out first in January last mm -hmm. year in the States. And I had finished it in 2019, February 2019, on a residency in Paris mm -hmm. at the Centre Culturel. Um, so there's a long journey and a long lag time between research, yes. publication, so that's why I have to go back and do the research twice. <laughs> yeah, and you must, you must feel a kind of certain intimacy with, with the subjects as well, having gone through that entire process and you know, become intimately familiar with their lives. Is there anything that stands out to you? Have, anything you weren't aware of before you began? Um, because I had read Maddox's biography when I was a teenager, mm. and then obviously I read Elman's biography of Joyce, which is magnificent, I was very familiar with the story, mm. but then in order to write the book, I went back and read them and drip-fed them to myself, and I would write as I go along. There's a great quote from Hilary Mantel, who's one of my writing heroes, mm. and she says, the consciousness of your character 
I'm, I'm mangling this, but anyway, the consciousness of your character is, um, their, their future is blank, essentially, mm. is what she's saying. So you're with them, they do not know what's coming, and so I sort of try and write in that way, mm. where as if I'm Nora, and I don't know what's coming next. I don't know Lucia is going to be diagnosed as a schizophrenic. Mm. I don't know that Giorgio is going to marry a woman who's also suffering with mm. uh, mental illness and subsequently has an affair with Peggy Guggenheim's, Guggenheim. So I don't know any of this as I go in. And so each event I try to treat as news for Nora, you know, so that the reader also feels, oh, I didn't see that coming, or that's news to me. Mm. Um, but there is an interesting thing about the research for these kinds of books. Like when I did the research for Emily Dickinson, mm. I read the book about her brother Austin who famously had an affair with this woman called Mabel Loomis Todd. And again, their letters are extant, their love letters, and they're quite mad mm. because they're very plotty and schemy and al almost paranoid. It's funny, mm. I was just thinking about Mabel today. She pops into my head every so often. Uh, ironically, she ended up as Emily's editor after Emily's death, and the estate got yeah. separated because Mabel owned a lot of the manuscripts after this and the letters and things. So you can read Mabel Loomis Todd and Austin Dickinson's letters, and again, they're very steamy. Austin is still married to Sue, Emily's great friend. They're still living together and having mm. this pretense of a marriage. Everyone in Amherst knows that he's with Mabel, and, it, and their letters are they're well worth a read, though I read them like this through my fingers, kind of like, oh my God, you know, we, we should not be able to read these letters. You know, and I remember thinking at the time, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about publishing them. And then I go on and do this, so. Yeah, you definitely <laughs> led the way. Um, I suppose, finally, just before we kind of open the floor up to the audience, what would you consider Nora's most important influence on contemporary culture? Well, well the fact that she, and you know, she was such a facilitator to him of his mm. writing and such a, a steady presence. She was the one who took him home from bistros at night and mm. flung him into taxis and while he screamed, save me from these scenes. Meanwhile, knowing well, he had to go home in order to get sleep, in order to write. Um, she looked after his health. He had extreme pain with his eyes. Mm. He really had a terrible time with his eyes. Also his stomach, because he was a daily drinker. He was dependent on alcohol. Mm. Um, and so he didn't like to eat much either, so his stomach was very bad. So she was always minding his health, minding his time, making sure he had time to write, that he wasn't off socialising too much mm. so that he could get the writing done. Because for most writers, having the time to write is the most important yeah. thing. And it's linked in, certainly for me, and certainly for a lot of the writers I know well, it's linked into our mental health. We're much better happier and better off if we're writing. Mm. We're sort of more shaky and cut loose when we're not writing. And so she knew it was better for Joyce to be mm. at his writing, you know, and she facilitated that. So her, like Stephen Joyce said, Nana was a rock, he said. I don't believe he could have done any of it without her. And I say here, here, he, he couldn't have. Mm. Yeah, we often talk a lot about kind of her role as caregiver and the strong support network around Joyce that helped him realise his potential as a writer, but do you feel that Nora's life lived to what she would have envisaged for herself beyond supporting Joyce in her own dreams? Do you think that they were fulfilled or? Well, I'd say she had a very different life than the life that was probably mm. the life that might have been expected of her, i.e., which would have been the mm. same as her mother's to marry somebody, hopefully marry kind of well and, you know, maybe have a lot of children because that's what you did. But she had a very different life. Mm. She ended up in Europe. She ended up speaking Italian at home. She ended up with just two children, which was unusual for mm. Irish Catholic families. Not that they were a practicing Catholic family, but Nora was quite, she was sort of a little devout, you mm. know. Um, no, she had a very different life. But I would say her loyalty to him, mm. um, her own personal capacity for happiness and cheer and hospitality, their sort of uh, bonding love and their love of music kept mm. them together. She was, she was mad about him and he was mad about her and in that sense they were great for each other. Yeah. I think that's a <coughs> very true sentiment. I think a good opportunity as well to open up 
questions to the floor as well. So if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, we just ask you to raise your hand and we'll get you um, in order. PJ. Yeah. Um, I'd just say, Mura, uh, you just finished reading your book and it's the most wonderful um, interpretation of uh, how I feel and go with the thing because uh, everyone talks about Joyce but few people talk about Nora and I love the way you've taken her from Poland and Croatia uh, to Zurich and uh, to Trieste and then to Paris and to England and um, she presents herself as someone who is extremely strong. I always felt that had Joyce not met her and, and uh, been with her, he wouldn't have been the great writer that he was. And uh, I love the way you handled it in a very, very delicate way, and also the letters. I mean, everyone loves those. I had written for the, uh, 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 um, the Argentinian embassy without ever, ever having read, read them before I came to the <laughs> And uh, I was, um, you know, one of my friends who was translating them into Spanish asked me if I would uh, read them in English, and I thought, well, just the two of us. And then uh, he cancelled three times, and the third time, uh, he arrived and said it would do this evening, and it was on a Tuesday. He cancelled on Friday and Monday, and then Tuesday they happened. And then uh, suddenly the whole uh, Argentinian embassy arrived. Laura, who was uh, sadly passed away, very in Galway, believe it or not, and uh, she had been tall, long, very beautiful, with her two nieces from Paris, and all these beautiful women and men from uh, uh, the Argentinian embassy and from Argentina. And I started to read them, never having read them, and I was gasping at what I read. And you see, you read them through your fingers. Uh, I couldn't believe, and then halfway through, um, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the translator said, well, we don't have to finish, you know, if you do. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this time you can't this far, we go her way. Yeah. So at the end of the letter, as I said to Laura, Laura, I've never read these before, and she said, PJ, it's so obvious. And, <laughs> and I said, are any questions? Dead silence. Yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you thank so you much so for much. what you've done, and I also thank you for your lovely uh, copy that you sent to me. And uh, I, I, I sent to you online, but I, I love, it's lovely to thank you in person. We're finishing the last chapter on Monday of next week. Sadly, you can't uh, be with us because we do it online from the States yes. and from Italy and from uh, Spain everywhere. And uh, um, people would love to have your take on it as well. So. Thanks so much, PJ. For anyone who doesn't know, PJ is in Sweeney's Pharmacy where Bloom goes to mm. buy his lemon soap that he carries around all day. So absolutely well worth your time to go and visit Sweeney's Pharmacy and have a chat with PJ, buy a book or a postcard or whatever you can. Lemon soap, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful place. Hello, yes, this man here. Yeah, um, I was just trying to figure out, uh, you're saying that Joyce came back twice yeah. from Switzerland. So he was 20 years in Ireland and he made two visits. He came back in 1909 and 1912. For, for, how, long, for how long um, were each of the visits? I think nine months or Actually, it was three visits, I think, because there was two in 1909 and then one in 1912. OK. So the one in 1912 was like a three-week holiday type of thing. And uh, that's it? Yeah. OK. So then, when he writes his stories, or when he's writing his Filling His Wake, and he does the history of the game, and all the landscape that's in it, he obviously hasn't seen it all. No. <laughs> but does he go to Joyce country and does he walk into Joyce land and the O'Malley story and discover all this while he's over in Galway or does he? Yeah, miss? Nora's uncle actually, um, so Michael Healy told him a lot about the history of Galway while he was there, about the Joyce's, about Lynch's castle and he used all of that in his work. He was a great man for using things. Yeah, but the Mike Turin story and... The, the Battle of the uh, Fir and the Tour de Gaulle oh, and in Joyce yeah. country itself, where his, where his ancestors are. Yes, absolutely. Well, did he, he go there or did well, he, he went out. Stolen? He went out to Utrard and he went out to the Aran Islands while he was there. But a lot of what he had, he got from books. He was a great man for getting people mm. to do things for him. And so he would have relatives send over the newspapers from Ireland, great packages of them. Um, books he had heard about that he wanted them to send over and he would usually send them the money from them. So he was doing all his research from his memory and from books he had and books people sent and newspapers and all the rest. Yeah, so he, he just was a gatherer. He was a person, he had a, a notebook called, um, I think it's called the Alphabet Notebook and I actually used a piece of it for the epigraph for this. He wrote everything down essentially. So under N in this notebook he wrote, Wherever thou art shall be Aaron to me for Nora. So everything he thought of alphabetically wrote down, he was a great man for keeping 
different colors in his notebooks, an organized person who used every scrap of everything. So all of that stuff that he would have learned about the Fir Bullock and the Tuha De Nan and maybe from some teacher in Clongos or Belvedere or maybe even in university, he kept to use on. And then he would say, so say Arthur Power was an Irish friend of his. If Arthur was visiting, he'd say, what do you know now about the Tuha De Nan? And then he'd write it down. You know, so he was always gathering from people and was very upfront about it. He had no problem with everyone knowing how he did it. There's a great quote from him which won't quite come to me, but it's about just that. So, so then you could say that um, in all the stories about all the Irish landscape, he probably only visited Tower Tango. Oh, yeah. He wasn't. He, he didn't. Someone said to me lately he didn't go much outside of Dublin before Nora. So he had been to Cork, his father's people's country. His father was from Cork. He had been to Mullingar. And then he went to Galway because of Nora. But essentially, he, wasn't, he hadn't travelled Ireland far and wide. Mm. So all those pieces about mm. Donegal and Ulysses and all of that are from his reading, essentially, and probably from, mm. you know, a, an amalgam of things the way everything is. He was a great man for amalgamating as well. Like, you know, not, Molly is not pure Nora. She's an amalgamation of several women that he knew. So, yeah, he put things together. <laughs> Caramila. Um, anybody else? Thank you very no? much for coming. Yeah. And there is one other thing I would like to say. Yes. Um, one of our people uh, who's done his thesis on the Volta cinema, and he's oh, well. going to read it with tomorrow night. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's going to bring uh, his thesis with him, and uh, he's going to talk about the Volta. Because again, uh, as you've written about Nora, a few people have written about the Volta. Yeah, absolutely, and it's fascinating because the choice of films that Joyce put on were very European, and I think they didn't go down hugely well <laughs> with the uh, audience in Dublin, but your friend's thesis will clarify all of that, no doubt. Yes, yeah, yeah. Great, well, if there aren't any other questions then, I'd just like to thank Nula again for joining us this evening Thanks, and providing an insightful um, overview of Nora and her time and the letters between herself and Joyce and to encourage anyone who hasn't already to pick up a copy of the book. We have them available here on site and in all good bookstores um, and I'm sure Nuala would be happy to sign a couple of copies if anyone has them with her this evening and to just thank you and on behalf of the festival for coming here this evening. So thank you everyone. Thanks, thank you. Thanks for